So I'm thinking about how my promotional experiment is going the other day. Seriously, I wish I would have thought about focusing on just one thing that I make a long time ago. I've learned so much from doing this. I talked last week about how I've kind of averaged selling two books a day. Before when I did this, I would just kind of, in general, going, hey, come check out my stuff, here's everything. But having to go with a specific item that only really speaks to a specific kind of person, it's a graphic novel. But if I create an ad or try to promote it, I can't just go people who read graphic novels because it's not a graphic novel. When you think graphic novels, really, you think like comic books. So it's not really that. And I can't really go for people who have suffered through tragedy or are going through hardships like dealing with breast cancer because a lot of those people probably don't read graphic novels. And again, it's not necessarily a graphic novel. It's a collection of daily cartoons. So that made me think about when I was growing up, I used to get those Garfield books. It was four panel comics. So that got me to thinking, how do I find a person that might be going through a hardship who has gone through a hardship that is also interested in reading Garfield novels? So that's really who I was looking for. And figuring out a way to find someone like that is what really made a huge difference. It even gives me more ideas for comics I want to make. Doing the daily comic is something cathartic that I do. I'd like to make something that is really just some sort of fiction. If I already know who the people who are interested in my graphic novel are, the different avenues that I have it in, like Amazon, Comixology, uh, Google Books, it might show me what other kind of things they're interested in, and maybe I could do a story about that. So that's the kind of thing that I'm learning from this, and it's really made a huge difference in the way that I'm looking at stuff right now. It's, it's kind of inspired me and made me feel a bit more creative towards, like, making something that I'm still interested in, but I know people might also be interested in. So this has been a great experiment, and I can't wait to move on to the next one. And as I do this, spending, like, 5 to $10 a day on ads, when I move on to the next one, and then I'll have two things where I might be spending $20 a day, but they're both making their money back, if not more. And they're going to kind of stack that way. So this experiment has really been kind of an eye-opener for me. I've learned a lot from it. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. So this week, the people that I'm talking to are actually two guys I used to work with when I was a software developer at some healthcare company. And I found out later on after I left the job that they actually left together and started their own company. So, of course, I had to go talk to them about that. Uh, My name is Rob Griffin. I'm a partner at TAC Video Production. And my name is Spencer Blessy. I'm also a partner at TAC Video Production. Now, while what they do is client work, which is something that I'm trying to get away from, they've actually been thriving at it and even have their own studio space that they set their stuff up at. So I wanted to find out more about what they do and how they do it. You guys ventured off. You worked... You were doing work for the healthcare field, a lot of video work, and then you ventured off to create, what do you call it, an agency? Because it is mainly video, but still there's marketing and story writing and all that kind of stuff involved. We realized that for us, the sweet spot was bringing um, agency creative sensibilities to video production. So my background is in creative advertising. We bring to bear elements of, of the entire project management set. Um, from creative development to execution. Spencer's uh, skill set is squarely in the, the execution wheelhouse, so he's uh, directing, shooting, editing, and I'm more in the production, writing, and project management component. And then together, we are also creative directing and developing. I always wondered, like, I knew that he shot video because in the past, he had shot video for us, for the band that I'm in, but I was curious, like, what the actual connection was that you guys had when you did work next to each other at this place so what is that dynamic like i would say it was sort of like this perfect marriage of skills i know (laughs) Uh, which has been great i guess for me i've always had i feel like a good grasp of the technical skills but all the other things that rob brings to the table i haven't really had as far as like directing concepting writing all those are not really my specialty but rob 
really brings all that stuff to the table. And I think together we just sort of melded. I don't know. What do you think? I think two questions that people ask when they're thinking about video and developing video content is, you know, obviously how much does it cost? Because I think a lot of people have in their head that it's expensive. Um, and I guess that's a relative term. I mean, it's a little bit like... Uh, getting a, an addition put on your house or a new kitchen or something like that. I mean, it's an impossible question to answer until you talk about the project and what you want to develop. And then the other question is, where do I start? Like, what does that even mean to do video or to produce video or to add video content to our marketing set? Mm -hmm. And so for us, having that skill set of the entire production capabilities means that we can start at the very beginning with somebody from zero. We've never done video before. We want to bring this to bear. We want to really develop this uh, uh, content. We can start at that point. Or we've done video in the past, but for whatever reason, it hasn't been where we want it to be. So we want to shift gears and, and bring you guys in to, to take it to the next level. Great, then we can come in at that point. All the way up to, we have an agency They've developed a, a marketing plan for us. We're, we're doing some branding work with them or whatever. We need you to slot in with that team that already exists. Well, we can do that too. So we can dial up or down the amount of, of project management we bring to bear. What we wouldn't want to do, I guess, is come in and, and simply shoot. You know, simply have turn on the cameras and, and start shooting. I mean, we, the planning is, is critical, um, and we're all about making sure that we're uh, formulating the plan and then shooting the plan. Say somebody who necessarily can't afford or think they can afford to do video wants to, but they're like, oh, that looks like it's going to be way too much. The short answer is it costs nothing to call us and talk to us. Uh, I mean, and I, I think that's the initial point is rather than self-edit the project in your own mind and say, well, we can't afford that or we couldn't do that or that's going to cost thousands of dollars. The formula for coming up with an estimate is very simple. We can plug those numbers in immediately and, and give you a ballpark of what we're talking about. Or, or you could just call us and say, this is the amount of money I have. What do I get for that? You know, we've been doing this for a while. So like we have a pretty good idea of what it would take to set up something like that almost immediately. So, and, and I would also say like we're pretty flexible. Like, you know, when it comes to I'd say flexible with our ideas of how to execute something like that. So, for example, so if it's a location shoot and they want like 20 different locations, we've done it where we've just green screened it. We did one project where it was like, okay, we're now in 20 different locations around the world. And so we just green screen people and then added in the locations after the fact. So, and then we tailored the, the, the post production or the style of the video, the look of the video to match that so that it did have a look and a feel that that sort of fit with, with the budget that we were shooting against. Yeah. One thing that we would emphasize is when you are thinking about budget, don't skimp on pre-production or yeah. the planning. I mean, that is a critical component. Don't assume that all I need is the gear and then now the content will flow from the camera. Yeah. And that's simply not true. In fact, it's just not an efficient way to use the money that you have. So. That's why I would say contact us, let us start planning, and let us think of the most efficient way to use the money that you do have. I think the other thing is, as much as we are talking to people about and combating this idea that video is expensive, we're also combating this idea that I can show up with my phone and start and just uh, shoot some stuff and just post that up there. I think that there is an element of, of skill and quality to bring to this. And if you are going for that sort of verisimilitude, that, that uh, point and shoot sort of look and feel, plan for that. Like, let's plan to get that look. And, uh, you know, there is still pre-production that needs to be done to execute it that way. So, in uh, like, there's a difference between writing an email and writing a novel. I mean, you can do it but it doesn't necessarily mean it will captivate audiences. So that's an important thing. There's still an element of storytelling. Yeah, taking that email analogy further, there's this idea that we still sculpt and mold and shape those emails. We all do that, you know, where we, we, we write the first draft and then we sort of save the draft and then we come back to it and we work with it a little bit. And so you want to do that with video too. We want to plan what we want to say and then, and then capture the material that's going to say it and then work with it in post to make sure that we've reduced it to its essence. I 
so do people come to you or did you start out actively finding people? Like, how did you actually find clients? We had a lot of contacts. You know, it's a lot of it comes from people we know from just from working in the healthcare world and from Rob's background in the agency world. So I feel like I just have always kind of known known people in town who have either been looking for video or or what have you. We talk about as we've been working with us, you know, why didn't we start this sooner? We should have been oh, we should we should have been doing this years ago. This is great, you know. Uh, and the truth is we couldn't have because it took this amount of time and the experience that we've had in the past to assemble the contacts that we have, the people that we know, and because it's critical to finding those those jobs and those clients is from around town and around uh, the area that we've worked with in the past that know us, that trust us, and want to work with us. And so that was a huge component. And then obviously there's the experience component, the experience that we have in agencies in the past. That's critical. So this was, it was just naturally the perfect time for us to make the move. I totally almost forgot that I recommended you guys for a job. Oh, absolutely. I think the job that you brought to us was, a, if not the first, one of the first jobs that we had that that was outside of our our immediate zone of influence. And it worked out great. Now, you guys actually do have a physical place. I was curious with the way things can be done nowadays, if that's a beneficial thing to do. Did you have that first? Did you need to get one? Like, how did that come about? So we debated this for a while, is, is the need for a space, and we're still debating it. A lot of the work we did in the beginning didn't require a large studio space. And so we opted just to find an editing office for ourselves, and that's what we've been working with. Now, this past year, we've been working more and more in larger studio spaces, and we've been renting those spaces. So now we are looking for a new space, a space that has a shooting space in it. And we just haven't found the right spot yet. So we keep going back and forth. And how do you find these places to rent? Because that's not easy to come by either. No, it's not. And it seems like no place is necessarily perfect, or it seems like every place is going to need something. And there's also this idea of trying to predict the, the kind of jobs you're going to need and whether you can accommodate them. The last thing we'd want to do is start renting a space only to find that it doesn't have everything we need and now we have to rent another space for whatever reason. That would be a disaster. So we're trying to hit this sweet spot and I don't know that we've seen it yet. Based around location, wanting to be close to me, Rob wants it to be closer to him. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's not something like, oh, the light is so much better downtown. No, no, no. no. We want enough space to, to move around comfortably and to, to set up the, the gear and the equipment that we can work really efficiently in the space. And so that requires a big space, but, you know, how big? It makes me think, oh, I'm talking to two guys in a band. It's like, no, no, they're because it's the same problem. It's, it's this weird gear that you have to lug around that you need, but technically the process of what you're doing could be done anywhere on a laptop and as long as you have an internet connection. How do you keep track of all this tons of video that you have to shoot? We have a lot of storage, terabytes and terabytes of storage. Online or your own server? It's not online. We have our own server for it in the studio. So I don't. I'm trying to think how many terabytes of I would love. To, I would love to know. I want to say like close to 80 terabytes of storage that we house like everything we've ever shot. So nothing ever gets deleted. We have a pretty good system of cataloging everything based on project. So everything kind of goes into these hard drives and then we just work from them. But it is a constant challenge because storage and how we use all of this information and it's always growing. We're constantly debating systems and you know mechanisms that we set up to do this and you know they're always coming out with new ways and faster ways to transfer this material sure. so we're always talking about okay you know what is the next thing that we need to get or we need to invest in to make this happen better and safer well i'm always terrified of the crash of anything and then you lose all that data so we have a redundancy system built in now. So, so if some, so if something does go down, we have we have a backup of it. That's why I've moved to uh, cloud servers, but I've never had to do as much data. That we just like when you're dealing with this much storage space to transfer that outward would just uh, that would that's what would take forever. How 
do you decide what the story you're going to tell is? And what's your background in learning how to do this? Again, it gets back to the pre-production. That's really where it starts. And my background in branding and advertising is all about focus. It's all about making sure that, that the message is simple. I would say, you know, you can say one thing well, you can say two things less well, and you can't say three things at all. So it's trying to convince our clients to understand that they really need to focus on a singular message. And so we want to work with them in the beginning to figure out what that is. So that when we're shooting, when we're on production, if we're interviewing somebody or we're out just capturing material or for whatever it is, we know it when we see it. You know, we can see that shot and be like, that's it. That's the thing that we were looking for. That's the thing that we wanted to capture. And it doesn't matter whether it's meticulously storyboarded or whether we're just shooting from the hip. We'll know it when we see it and, and, and have it. And then in the post-production, yeah, it's, it's working with all of that material. You know, the, the production part of it, that's like just gathering the clay. When Spencer takes it into the post-production, that's where you sculpt it. That's where you cut away the bits that you don't need. And have you already kind of thought of the concept of what you're doing from then? I mean, I know it can change in mold, and all of a sudden you can do different things with it afterwards. But. Yeah, I think it depends, too, because if we walk in with a storyboarded idea, it's different than us walking into a totally blank slate of, of what we're going to shoot, and that's happened, that's happened as well. So I feel like we've walked into so many blank slates that we just hop right into action and kind of just start gathering whatever we can get. But we do have some sort of outline about what, what it is, the story we're trying to tell. So if that involves interviews or you know what kind of interviews would involve or B-roll, we just start going and we just capture, capture information. And then, like I said, we get it back and then Rob and I go over the footage together. I'll usually create like a rough edit about what I think are the best shots and what I think are the best snippets of the interviews and then we just keep molding that and molding that over and over until we feel like we get it right. When you're not working, like what is the stuff that would be the type of thing you would do as a passion project? You know, we talk about these when we're driving to a location or something like that. We'll be in the car and we'll say, oh, you know what a great idea would be and I forget we had one the other day. It was something about the 70s or the 80s. Well, we're going to do an 80s video promoting our services, like straight up just an 80s rip, like an 80s music video. And we're going to write the song. Yeah, this, is, right. this is very early stages now, but we're going to write the song. And you guys are going to perform it for okay. us. All right. And then we're going to shoot a whole awesome 80s montage video. I think we got the idea from that, the, was it the Stranger Things promo for next year? Yeah. It takes place in a mall. It's like a promo for a mall. And I said, we have to do that for us. That would be so fun. So, so we, talk, we talk about stuff like that, projects that we would do. Uh, I bring up like documentary films that I think we should do about the area. Just do, you know, it would be funny is if we did this documentary about, you know, we'll pass by something or we'll see something as we're out traveling around Wisconsin. We'll be like, or we should do a video about like all of the sculptures, like the like the Cheese House Mouse, or like we think we should travel around Wisconsin and do a documentary of just about these sculptures that people have out in front of their businesses. And then we leave it. And then we're like, okay, let's get to work. And then we start working on the project. Yeah, I, I, I'm fully aware that it's like, yeah, those those are fun. And that's why I ask, because it's like, well, you'd need like a grant or somebody to pay you to take the time to do it. Or, you know, you would just spend all your free time doing that and then working all day. We do that. I mean, we'll go out and just shoot time lapses of Madison or, or surrounding areas. Just if it's a nice day, just to get the footage. We don't know what we'll use it for. Or some aerial photography. Just depends. I do like the fact that the first thing I asked, you're like, oh, an 80s music video. I can't wait. It's going to be so good. How do you promote yourself? We have been just working with people that we know, and that kind of continually expands. Um, at a certain point, you bump up to the edges of that, and then you think, okay, well, now how do we promote ourselves uh, beyond our cloud or our, our personal sphere of influence? And, uh, it's something that we wrestle with all the time. So uh, we do things like this. We talk to people like you. That kind of thing works well. We talk to, we just get to know people. We, you know, we, we have conversations with people. We let people know what we do. We have, you know, a compact little uh, sort of elevator speech that we can open with and, um, and then we can, then we can take it from there. The odds of us meeting somebody at the moment when they happen to be gathering estimates for a video project are pretty slim. It's hard to hit that window. Yeah. So it's better just to get to know people and meet people and be nice to people. Mm -hmm. And eventually they'll come back around. It might be three, four, six months, um, but they'll, 
they'll come back hopefully and and contact us. I've found even the strangest connections I've made have been like when I'm just passing through something or I'm at a place and it's like, oh, hey, this is this person. And then they find out what you do and suddenly they know somebody or they need to do something. Like that's the weirdest, like the one-on-one connection is way more successful than like the cold call. But do you guys even do the cold calls? No, we we really don't for exactly that reason. It It's just not a, a sales tool that lends itself to video to call people up out of the blue and and sort of start with a a sales pitch like that. Similarly, you know, we have social media feeds. We try to put stuff out there. I mean, obviously, social media feeds lend itself to video, so um, it seems like it's the kind of thing that is a no-brainer. And we do obviously put stuff out, projects out there as we complete them. But beyond that, we're not super diligent about today's the day I have to tell my Instagram feed what I'm up to. That doesn't seem like a... That doesn't seem like an authentic way uh, to have those conversations we were talking about, um, where you really are meeting somebody and just getting to know what they do. And then uh, when you talk to them about what you do, it just sparks interest for for the future. People do want to get in touch with us and talk about video content and, and how it could work for them. Our website is tacvid.com, T-A-C-K-V-I-D.com, or rob at tacvid.com. Or spencer at tacvid.com. That was awkward. That was an awkward exchange there. That was. I think you're being weeded out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How did you come up with the name? We landed on the name Tac Video Production because tac is a, it's an adjective used in uh, photography circles. Uh, going way back. And basically it describes the moment that an image is in perfect focus. So a cinematographer or a photographer would describe a shot as tack. That's tack, meaning it is as sharply in focused as it can be. And so we took the idea not only because it has a cinematic element to it, but also because we, again, getting back to that idea of pre-production, we like the idea of focusing as sharply or as clearly on a a subject or a topic as, as it can be. And so it seemed to fit for us perfectly. Spencer and Rob again confirmed the theory that everybody keeps telling me, which is, it's who you know. It's about meeting people. It's about networking. I just don't know who I'm supposed to rely on when I'm doing this stuff. So for the most part, I've just been relying on myself. So next week, I talk to a guy who has a really different way of thinking of things because he's actually kind of a scientist, but turned that into being an artist. It's really, he reached out to me and he's really interesting. So check that out next week. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to this show at AmericanBandito.com. And the music for the show is by my band, Lorenzo's Music. Then you can check that all out at Lorenzo'sMusic.com. So until next time, so long. Hey, 